and welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Hillwood. This is a podcast about understanding other people, the things they do, and the things they say. You can learn more about this podcast and get a premium subscription at peoplewhoreadpeople.com. I've been resharing some of the better episodes from early in my podcasting run, back before I had much of an audience. This episode will be a talk I had in 2019 about psychology in the restaurant and service business. I talked to Robin Dibble, a longtime professional in the restaurant business, and we covered some topics I think you might have wondered about before and might find interesting, including tricks that servers use to try to increase tips, how the rise of social media has impacted restaurant businesses and how they treat their customers, how changes to a menu's layout can have a big impact on what people order, the importance of lighting, acoustics, and aesthetics in helping create a welcoming atmosphere. A quick note here before I start the interview, with the political polarization work I've done, I sometimes get people asking me, where do you get your news from? What news do you recommend? The news site I've mainly been promoting lately is Tangle News. You can subscribe to it for free at readtangle.com. Tangle aims to be a nonpartisan news source. I'll say I very much enjoy reading a news source that I can feel confident is free of partisan bias. I talked to the creator of Tangle, Isaac Saul, for the podcast a while back, and so if you want to learn more about his work and why I think Tangle helps reduce toxic polarization, check that talk out. Again, you can sign up for free at readtangle.com. Okay, here's the talk with Robin Dibble about psychology and behavior in the restaurant business. Okay, welcome to another edition of the People Who Read People podcast. This is Zach Elwood, and today is April 17th, 2019. And today I'm going to have on Robin Dibble, who's done pretty much every position possible in the restaurant and service industry business, mostly in the Albuquerque and Phoenix areas. He's managed a lot of restaurants, including P.F. Chang's for three years and several Italian restaurants, including Buca di Beppo, if you know that one. He's managed and bartended at one of the busiest nightclubs in Albuquerque, the Library Bar and Grill. Most recently, he helped oversee the opening and operation of a poke fusion restaurant in Albuquerque called Poke Poblano. And that restaurant did quite well. It got an average of 4.5 stars and 184 Yelp reviews in about its 10 months of operation. But unfortunately, ended up closing just a couple weeks ago because apparently the restaurant industry is quite tough. And most people, I think, know that. Personally, I've known Robin for about 15 years from when I lived in Albuquerque. We actually met through the poker scene. That was around the time when I first started playing at casinos and moving up in stakes a bit compared to the smaller home games I'd played before that. And Robin always struck me as a very smart and observant guy. He always had a lot of great stories to tell about the the restaurant business. And just recently, my wife and I were actually brainstorming an idea for opening up a restaurant in, uh, in Portland here, Portland, Oregon. And I called up Robin to consult on the idea, and we actually met up and talked about a lot of ideas, and he was a huge help and brought a lot of insider knowledge. And he also makes himself available for other similar consultation work for restaurant opening and operation and just general strategies around that. Hey, Robin, thanks for coming on. Hey, Zach, thanks for having me. So today, Robin and I are going to be talking about psychology and understanding customer behavior in the restaurant and service industry. And obviously, a lot of success in the restaurant business is about perception and how customers subjectively feel about the experience based on the decor and the atmosphere and their interactions with servers. So it's no surprise there's a lot of psychology in the business. It's a people business. So we'll talk about perceptions and manipulating perceptions. So uh, first, I thought it'd be cool to start out with that anecdote you told me about your early days of serving at Italian restaurant Buca di Beppo and about the waiter who was popular with the kids. Sure, sure. Yeah. When I was first learning how to serve and wait tables, you know, I had worked my way up from a busser and I was super eager to, you know, do well. And every shift that I worked, I, you know, I I would do okay. You know, I would do pretty respectable money. The sales were decent, but my tip average was always a little bit lower than, you know, my counterparts. One thing I noticed from a server that I worked with named Nick, uh, is this guy was super friendly, you know, very, very kind of upbeat guy. And he had a way with, families that no one else could seem to accomplish. So, you know, when you get a table of families with kids, you know, sometimes you have to prep yourself for, there's sometimes more things you have to take care of. So often, you know, servers don't really find themselves loving tables of families. I had had hit or miss experiences with families myself, you know, never really 
could understand why I didn't ever make great tips from families. And I started to watch Nick and Nick would have people eating out of the palm of his hand. I mean, families with kids just adored him and the kids would always request him on their next visit. And he would have regulars constantly coming in that families with young kids that just loved him. And I couldn't ever really figure it out. One day I was watching Nick, he was in the section right next to me and I just taken an order. And I noticed that Nick always kept a crayon behind his ear. And we had crayons for families because, you know, kids want to color on the, on the, you know, coloring pages and do tic-tac-toe and stuff. But Nick would always grab one of the green or blue crayons out of the pack, stick it behind his ear. And he would wear that crayon behind his ear the entire shift. He never wrote with it. It never got used. It was just there. And it definitely made him appear more friendly. It made him more approachable. Um, you know, when kids saw that they immediately had a connection with this guy because, oh, look, he likes, you know, he likes crayons too, I guess. But it was just that subtle little difference of, you know, a psychological approach to the job that, that really struck me and really got my, you know, my wheels turning as far as like, okay, what are the, you know, what are the techniques that I can use? And honestly, I stole the crayon idea. I put one behind my (laughs) ear and for the next two weeks, I, I made better tips on average. I did use stuff like that from time to time. And that was just one of those, that was like really early on in my serving career. And I think that really opened my eyes up to the other side of, you know, the job of serving, you know, that there's, it's one thing to just bring everything they ask for and and kind of be there if they need you. But it's another thing to really, you know, try and, you know, influence their experience and kind of influence their perception of you Uh, goes a long way and actually can make you a lot more money. Right. Yeah. It makes you think that there's, there must be a ton of other little uh, psychological tricks you can do to to re- make people respond to you and get a higher tip. There's absolutely a ton. Um, some of the best companies that, you know, that I've worked for that did that were some of the corporate ones that had a lot of, you know, thought behind the service and the thought behind, you know, the steps of service. But some of the stuff that I've seen, you know, actually taught in restaurants is a concept they call tip talk, where, you use phrases and words to kind of highlight the things you're doing without being obvious or nagging about it. You know, instead of, for instance, if somebody says, you know, they'd like another refill or something and you notice that they need some more lemons, right? Instead of saying, you know, I'll bring you some more lemons or, you know, would you like some more lemons? You would go grab the refill, you grab the lemons. And when you bring them back, instead of just saying, here's your lemons, you would say, you know, oh, you know what? I noticed you needed some more lemons. I went ahead and brought that for you. You know, I went ahead and, you know, filled this up for you. I went ahead and grabbed this box for you because, you know, it's just saying the things that you're already doing, but just kind of highlighting it from a stance of, you know, oh, I went ahead I and took the care to do this for you. It's a very subtle, but obvious at the same time kind of technique that really kind of starts to Im- implant this, the seed in the guest's mind that, you know, this person is going above and beyond for me, or this person is doing more than the average server for me. You know, the other the last time I ate here, the server maybe wasn't, you know, wasn't communicating as well. It re- kind of reminds me of like, I worked for uh, some neuro-linguistic programming uh, hypnotherapy seminar guy. And he was, he was big into these like, you know, subtle uses of words. I mean, a lot of that stuff to me was bullshit, but there, there definitely was some good, uh, good truth in there. Like the more realistic applications of that, you know, framing things, basically how you want them to be framed. Definitely. I, think. Definitely. I mean, even subtle words, like, you know, instead of saying no problem, I started to get into how to saying absolutely. Because I noticed that, you know, the, the phrase no problem kind of had an off-putting effect on some people, um, not on everybody. You know, I, I noticed that younger groups, millennial groups tend to find no problem a much better response, you know, because it seems kind of more, you know, dialed into their kind of specific mode of communication. But, you know, baby boomers d- didn't really appreciate the no problem aspect. They kind of took it as like, yeah, well, I know, you know, I know it shouldn't be a problem. Like, <laughs> why are you telling yeah. me it's no problem? It, it's your job, you know? And then other, you know, it just depends. And again, it goes back to reading people, you know, you have to kind of change your approach and change how you, how you operate based on, you know, on who's sitting in front of you. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I can see from older people expect a little bit more formality and saying no problem. It it implies really subtly, like I didn't have to do this for you, you know, or something. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Huh. Any other uh, tip talk? uh, Because I I think that stuff's really interesting. Anything else spring to mind? There's there's subtle, you know, there's, there's subtle hints throughout the, throughout the meal that you can pick up on. And, you know, ultimately, you know, and it's, it obviously ties very well with your podcast. You know, the entire art of serving really is about reading people and not just serving, but managing, you know, you really have to gauge if somebody's, you know, in a hurry, if somebody's upset, if somebody looks agitated, you know, you have to use all these subtle clues. Um, And it starts with as soon as they walk in the door, you know, I would actually employ the host staff to really start the process right then and there and get as many clues and as much information about their experience as possible before they even sit down 
so that the server can go in there kind of understanding what the parameters are and what the expectation is. You know, if, if they walk in and the guest mentions right away, oh, we've got a flight to catch at, you know, 1.30, we're just trying to grab a quick lunch. Well, absolutely, the server is going to approach that table very differently than someone mm-hmm. coming in to celebrate, you know, a 40th wedding an- anniversary, you know, things of that nature. So reading the expectation is is important, reading, you know, how much time you might have. While we're on the subject of PF Chang's, one of the other things that I found really interesting is, you know, they would take it further for a management standpoint and they would have um, kind of a culture where we had, you know, as a manager, we were kind of tasked to look for triggers and, you know, triggers are basically something that happens or some situation that would trigger a response from us to maybe go above and beyond, you know, the general, you know, call of duty. So it can be something very simple as maybe a couple's coming in and they mention, you know, it's, they're celebrating an anniversary, but it's, you know, it's not a big deal. And they're just having a nice dinner and some part through the meal, you know, maybe one of the guests says, you know, I've always wanted to try that dish, but I just never ordered. I always get the same thing. So a trigger in that respect for a manager would, you know, the server would say, Hey, this guy mentioned that he really wanted to try this, you know, this dish. And I was wondering if maybe we could just, you know, get him one for free or maybe a half portion just so they could try it out, Mm -hmm. you know? And that was our opportunity to kind of go above and beyond and wow the guests a little bit and say, you know, you mentioned it. We wanted you to try it, take it home. If you're not, you know, if you have too much food, it's, it's on us tonight. And that really leaves like a lasting impression. You know, that that's a huge psychological um, benefit for restaurants to hone in on is that, you know, that loyalty of, man, those guys really took care of me and I really appreciated it. And I'm, I'm definitely going back. I'm definitely going to recommend them. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting talking about how, you know, corporations are, are understanding some of that behind the scenes strategy. I was reading this. Uh, I shared this with you, this Wall Street Journal article about servers reading people. And I'll just quote a, a paragraph or so here. Uh, It says, even chain restaurants like Denny's, TGI Fridays, and Romano's Macaroni Grill are focusing more on personalized service by training staff to note body language, eye contact, and offhand remarks, hoping to make service feel less mechanical. Traditionally, eateries taught waiters to follow a script and push add-ons like desserts and drinks. Some restaurants still employ waiter scripts, but now they are being used to dig for guest information. At Romano's Macaroni Grill, an Italian-themed chain, Waiters are taught to use their scripted offer of house wine to find out if the table will want a fast, leisurely, or lively meal. If they say no, well, we're going to the theater, then the waiter knows dinner is not the main event, says Brandon Coleman III, chief marketing officer for the company. To speed up service, the waiter may bring the check at the same time as the food. So it was just kind of interesting to me, like tying into what you were saying, you know, some of these softer skill psychological things like were probably things the you know, we're, we're thought of as something to not focus on at a corporate level, but it seems like as the corporations, you know, learn more and more, they're recognizing like, well, this stuff's really important to, you know, brand loyalty and, and, and emotions and people leaving reviews. So we got to work this into our, our strategies. Absolutely. And a lot of that stuff comes from guest feedback. You know, I mean, after years and years of people, you know, having the same common complaints, you know, a lot of those complaints were often just told to your friends. I mean, before the onset of Yelp and and all the review sites, it was, it was really one of those situations where a a good experience, you know, a guest would tell a few people and a bad experience, they would tell everyone they came in contact with, you know, it was Mm -hmm. one Mm -hmm. of those things that you just knew that, you know, bad experiences spread like wildfire. And so once social media and online reviewing kind of came to the forefront, I feel like a lot of these companies really started to see a much larger sampling of, you know, the common complaints. What are, what is, you know, what is a common issue that people have? Well, you know, I had to wait too long to, to pay my check on a lunch break. That's a very common complaint. You know, I would always tell my servers in training, you can make people wait to sit down for over an hour, which is insane to me. You know, after years of working in restaurants, I don't tend to wait that long anymore, but people will wait hours to sit down. You know, they'll wait for food, they'll wait for drinks, they'll wait for service and they'll do it generally just kind of under the expectation that that's what happens, but waiting to pay their check is literally the only thing people don't want to do. And and I tend to agree. It's when you're done with your meal and you're ready to go, the last thing you want to do is just sit there, you know, almost kind of like in a prison, just waiting to, to give them their money. You know, I always said you should never make someone wait, you know, to give you their money. That's rule number one. And from that same Wall Street Journal article, it had something about that in it too. It said one of the quotes was, when researchers ask customers which restaurant service mistake is worst in terms of overall satisfaction, they said not promptly settling the check when the guest is ready to leave. So that's real interesting. Yeah, I I can definitely... Well, I'm sorry. It also touches on the fact that that's the the last experience that they're having before they walk out Mm -hmm. the door. 
you know, right. so they could have had a great dinner and it could be tarnished in you know some respect just because they were frustrated right before they left. So how has uh, social media changed how you approach the restaurant business? Do you feel like it's made you more uh, thoughtful about individual experiences or has it not changed much at all in your opinion? You know, it's, it's become, it's become challenging and it ha- I've seen social media work really well for businesses now. And I've also seen social media be very hard on businesses where in the past that negative feedback wouldn't travel nearly as far. I think it's a difficult, it's a difficult subject for a lot of business owners now because the younger business owners are are very in tune to social media and they're very they're very reactionary based on feedback online whereas some of the old school business owners might not put a lot of stock into the online reviews um and that can be good or bad you know i've i've seen kind of out of touch business owners who aren't as technology you know based and don't have an understanding of how social media can affect them really put a negative image out there without realizing it just in some of their responses and some of how they operate you know in the public eye and that can be pretty damaging in the long run. You know, it's maintaining your your online, you know, persona goes really far for businesses. You know, obviously, obviously most most technology businesses and, and a lot of new businesses now are are very social media based and maintaining your reputation is a huge part of it. But restaurants are kind of in that half and half stage where, you know, half of the restaurants coming up are now very, very much online driven and the restaurants that have been doing it forever are either catching up to that or just saying, you know what, we've made it this far without it. It's not part of what we do and we don't have to worry about it. Um, I really think it's a mix. You know, I've, I've often heard people say, and I tend to agree, you know, likes and views don't translate to dollar signs and they don't, they don't, you know, it's very easy. It's very easy to put a flashy video out there to get your network, to support it, to share it. You know, suddenly you boost it with a few hundred dollars on Facebook ads and you've reached 20,000 people. But how many of those people are actually coming in your restaurant? You know, most people are just saying, oh, that looks cool. I'm going to like it, continue to scroll and then right. never change their dining habits at all based on it. You know, let's get back to the um, reading uh, customers. Are there any tips or anything you look for? Like, say you're a manager, or a server and you're looking around the room. Are there any kind of like long distance signs that people are unhappy or, or irritated and, and you go help them out? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's hundreds, you know, there's. Honestly, all of these are very relatable to, you know, any kind of tells. There's a lot of those types of tells that that come into the dining experience. I mean, yeah, obviously, if somebody's sitting there with their arms crossed and frowning, that's a very clear indication that something's wrong. Um, but it goes, it goes much more subtly than that. I think, you know, often I just, if I see people just kind of looking around the room, if I look at a table and I see more than one head up away from their food or away from the people at the table and looking around the dining room, I know that entire table is on alert for their server or they're looking for something that hasn't been delivered yet, or maybe they're waiting too long for something. Um, so there's a, I mean, there's a ton of very, I think for me, they're, they become very obvious. I don't know. Maybe there's, there's more subtlety than, than I'm giving them credit to at times, but um, yeah, I, I would be able to scan a room pretty quickly and, and figure out where I needed to be next. Um, I think that was what, you know, I've learned how to be the most effective is really just, you know, is just engaging with everybody. I, I wouldn't, I'm never one of those people that kind of just stand and watch a room too much. I, I think you can learn some of that, but I think you learn a lot more by actually approaching the table. I would get a lot of, I would get a lot more clues if I walked towards the table, because if they immediately noticed me walking up, then I knew they were waiting to tell me something, you know, if they were kind of surprised to see me, but then looked up and they seemed, you know, obviously all smiles, then I just kind of scanned the table for can I clear a plate? Can I refill a drink? Can I do something? You know, can I grab something to kind of make my trip, you know, worth it? Obviously, you know, you never really want to go to a table empty handed, leave a table empty handed, you know, one or the other, you should probably, you know, have something in your hands, either going or coming or something. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of, there's lots of kind of subtle, subtle clues. You know, I, I will always scan a plate, you know, and I'll see how much of that plate has been touched. You know, is there an area of that plate that clearly, is completely untouched while the other portion is, you know, kind of demolished and, you know, or is most of the dish completely uneaten and they're just sitting there kind of poking around at it. You know, there's a lot of physical clues that, you know, Oh, is everything okay with that? You know, is that, you know, is it cooked you're liking or, you know, is that taste okay? Or was it too spicy? You know, I just start asking questions. You have to be specific. And as soon as you start getting specific, you immediately can tell before they open their mouth and respond, you know, just the body language, you know, the shoulders kind of, you know, a little defensive looking or the head kind of, you know, cocked to the side going, uh, you know, you immediately know, mm-hmm. like, okay, I need to address that. And part of the psychology for me is I think a lot of people get on the defensive or people feel weird 
pointing out an issue. You know, there's a lot of times when there might be something kind of not not blatantly wrong with the food, but maybe it just wasn't hot enough or maybe it just didn't taste very good. And people don't want to complain because they a lot of times they say, right. well, I ordered it. You know, I chose this dish and so I'm committed to it. But right. and they're know, just polite, yeah, polite in general, exactly. like and, too polite and, kind of thing. Yeah. And so and a lot of those people, you know, if I approach it and say, would you like me to remake it? The answer a lot of times is no, don't worry about it. That's fine. What I started doing was just saying, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and remake that for you. And, you know, sometimes the answer is still no, no, no. But I just say, you know what, I, it's fine. I'm, I'm you know, I'm just going to remake it. And if they fight you tooth and nail, then, you know, I probably just take it off the check. But in some way, I have to just go ahead and kind of circumvent. Go with your read. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Go with my read and just know that, like, I'm going to go ahead and just do this because there's been so many times in the past when I was learning how to manage and growing up in the businesses and, and kind of filling my way out where I thought I had addressed a problem. They assured me that they were completely satisfied. And then right. the next day, the corporate office gets an email saying, you know, basically stating that, you know, they had a great meal. Things were OK, but there was just this one thing that didn't work out. Right. Well, and they just wanted somebody to know. And it's like, you know, I appreciate the feedback, but then my corporate office has to send me an email right. and then I have to send them an email and then I have to invite them right. back in when in reality, I could have just comped that dish, taken off the track. Yeah, they're not, and then they're not going to doing email. you any favors. No, exactly. Yeah. And people don't yeah, uh, yeah. I don't think people always realize that you know, instant feedback is the most valuable thing you can do for a restaurant. You know, um, there's, there's also a lot of psychological clues that, you know, you cue in on that when people aren't unhappy, you know, you can also kind of read when people are, you know, wanting to give you that feedback. So it's kind of a nice opportunity when you have the guests that are willing to give it, you know, you kind of notice that they are just, you know, all smiles and very happy. And then you can sit there and have just a nice conversation about it and, you know, about their experience. And that allows you to kind of make a connection and, and you know, kind of get some of that, uh, that shroud of, you know, where this, where this big business that doesn't really care about you and you, you connect on a personal level and they become fans of you, the individual, you know, and that, that's how, I think that's the biggest benefit for servers is really finding how to, how to bring people back that, that are there for them. You know, the people are, mm -hmm. are often your biggest asset. You know, you spend, you know, one of your highest expenses in restaurants is definitely labor. So if you can invest in good people, you know, it, it works wonders because those people invest in their guests and those guests in turn, you know, reinvest in those people. And so, uh, you know, I've had a lot of great relationships, but out of, you know, a bartender, regular, you know, relationship or a server, regular relationship where, you know, these people just kind of become people that they're friends with. And eventually, you know, kind of like family members, I've had regulars end up, you know, selling houses to servers or, you know, offering to help people buy cars or, you know, just inviting people to their weddings. You know, there, I had a server who got married and there was at least five or six people at the wedding that were just customers at the restaurant but had been oh, customers wow. of his for five years, you know, and I'm sure they'd mm -hmm. over time paid, you know, countless bills of his. So definitely cool. I would think uh, working so long in the restaurant, you would get kind of a sixth sense about seeing what people need at like almost like this unconscious level, you know, just kind of instinctually like look around and be like, Oh, these people are unhappy. These people are getting ready to leave, whatever, you know, it must just come second nature. Absolutely. To you. Well, it's um, part of the planning too, you know, in the, in the, the, how you operate the restaurant, you know, you're, you're, your host staff has to look and kind of be able to read the table and see, okay, are they finished? Are they, you know, are they about to get up? Where's my next table going to open up so I can seat them? You know, so there's, yeah, there's a lot that, that kind of comes inherently, you know, you just, you just learn to read people. Well, even, you know, even the state, the state requires you to do that as a server and a bartender. When it comes to alcohol sales, you have to read people. All right. You have to, it's a complete, it's illegal not to, because you, if you overserve somebody, you know, you are faced with, potential jail time. I mean, you know, it's, it's one of those situations that can be, you know, really ugly. So, you know, as a bartender or a server serving alcohol, the entire process is about reading people, you know, what do their eyes look like? How are they talking? What's their body language? Mm. What, what do they smell like? You know, a physical read, right. <laughs> but um, how are they acting? Yeah, how are they acting? Yeah. They, you know, and when people are drinking, are, you know, are they having a good time? Are they having too much of a good time? Are they upset? You know, there's, there's so many factors that come into play, um, especially from, you know, the bartending standpoint where, you know, your job is, is a little bit more volatile when you're serving mm -hmm. alcohol, you know, there, it, it becomes pretty important. So that's not just about the amount you, you because theoretically they could have a high tolerance Correct. or whatever. So you're, you, it's mainly about behavior, keeping an eye on, on how they're acting. Um, it's, it's both. Um, it's both, you know, yeah. like, like you said, you don't know what that person was doing before they got there. So really that's where the behavioral mm -hmm. stuff comes into play. But if you're starting, you know, from scratch and let's say that the first drink they're having is in your restaurant, um, then you do kind of do the math breakdown and actually the training has gotten pretty good on that. It used to kind of just be, you know, well, males have this 
tolerance and females have a lower one mm. and this body weight, you know, you can have this many drinks per, per pound, basically per hour. Um, it's gotten a little bit more developed than that. I think, you know, they've started to take into factor, you know, weight a little bit more in size and, you know, and, and then they started training more on the emotional um, side of it. Cause I, I, I'm not hundred percent sure on this, but I've been told that there's studies that say that if, you know, obviously if somebody's in an, in a bad mood and they start drinking, the bad mood can get worse or they can become drunk mm. faster. Um, you know, sometimes your emotions can make alcohol, you know, come into play more, um, more quickly, I guess. Um, another interesting thing that I've learned through that training was that when you're sitting down in a bar seat with your legs dangling, oftentimes it cuts off circulation to your legs and so somebody could be sitting there having drinks and, you know, appear to be just fine. And maybe they sat still in that same seat for about two or three hours. And when they stand up, um, I believe the police officer that we talked to, he called it the wobbles. They stand up and all of the blood kind of rushes down, you know, downward for a bit. And you get kind of lightheaded mm. and you feel suddenly much drunker. Um, oh there's God. also a sphincter muscle in your, you know, somewhere in your digestive tract that when you're sitting, it's generally closed off. And when you stand, it actually opens up. And so hmm. the combination of the blood rush and then, you know, kind of an, a dumping of alcohol into your system um, can appear to make people look way more drunk than they actually are, you know, or maybe act way more drunk for a few, for a period of time until it kind of mm -hmm. corrects itself. You know, it's interesting. Cutting people off is, is delicate. And I, I, I really like the approach of just handing somebody a card and it's basically like a business card that just says um, you've been cut off. Please leave please leave respectfully and quietly and no one has to know. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a really smart choice because then it lets somebody sit there and digest the decision. It allows them to choose if they want to be loud about it. And if mm -hmm. they don't want to have an embarrassing interaction, then they just respectfully pay their tab, say thanks right. and go. And, um, it's less confrontational. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make it public, et cetera. Yeah. So uh, I know uh, menu strategy is a big, um, a big area. Obviously, there's some people that are full time, you know, there's, there's businesses that are like full time menu consultants, just because there's so much psychology there. Absolutely. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little, a little bit about things you've heard of or, or seen or worked on that, that sure. come into play for menus? Yeah, menus are, you know, menus are the story of your business. It's how you tell your tale. It's how you tell, tell the guests what you are about. It's how you communicate what you're culture is it's you know it's it's how you communicate everything really um and so it's a very important piece of the business and i think a lot of people don't put enough stock into the fact that this is a, a really important piece that needs to be you know needs to be dealt with you know really really intelligently um and it's a hard thing to figure out because every concept kind of garners a different approach and a different a different respect to to what you highlight you know i kind of touched on it earlier but if you're a french restaurant your menu is going to have a lot of words that, you know, might not be layman's terms. They might be, you know, kind of more refined and, and they have that air of, you know, elitism a little bit. Like if you right. don't understand what these dishes are, or this sauce is, then your education is, you know, you might not know enough. And and, it, and so some people really like that. And in, a, in an upscale restaurant where people are going to go, you know, buy a $50 entree or a hundred dollar bottle of wine. Yeah. They don't want it to read like a, you know, a fast casual menu that, that anybody could understand and go in there and do that they want it to be kind of like, they kind of want to be an expert. If, if you're taking, you know, a group of people out and you're going to buy them dinner and you want to impress somebody, you want to take them to a place where they might not know everything on the menu, but you do, or you might pretend you do, you know, so you're kind of the expert. Um, so yeah, menu design in that respect often is very elegant. Um, you know, descript descriptions can be kind of anywhere from a, a full paragraph all the way to very, very, you know, quick and, you know, a few words. I think there's a lot of approaches there in the fine dining world that conflict each other because, you know, some chefs really want the entire story of the dish and where it was foraged and all the techniques to be listed right then and there. And then some places actually would prefer that their service staff is the one delivering that message. And so the, the descriptions are very mm -hmm. brief. Um, mm -hmm. Another, another kind of psychological thing to doing the brief descriptions is you really don't have a gauge on what that plate should look like. Or maybe you do, and it's completely different. You know, just reading what the words are. I think one of the more surprising things for a lot of diners, and I actually kind of enjoy it myself, is when I read something and I go, oh, that sounds really good. And I'm thinking that it's going to look some a certain way, and it comes out and it looks completely different. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. that can work and that, you know, that could go one way or another for you. But I think it's fun when you when your expectations are kind of are kind of smashed, you know, when you have that ability to wow people and go, wow, I had no idea it was going to look like that, you know. 
but that's like that just lists uh they'll just list a few ingredients and it doesn't give you a sense of like how they're assembled exactly. kind of it'll just say like yeah. cauliflower this that or whatever but you don't know that the cauliflower is you know cut this way and roasted and you know has curry spices on you know you just don't have the meat of it um and that can backfire on you too because you know not enough information like you know taking a step down from fine dining and going to like what most americans eat in like large chain restaurants large large corporate restaurants if you take that approach you end up with a lot of complaints because they're like, that's, well, that's not what I thought I was getting. You know, um, I think there needs to be some level of familiarity, um, based on the concept, you know, the corporate restaurants are often really smart about, you know, how they lay their menu out. Obviously the standard approach of, you know, starters, you know, mains, sides and desserts are usually not broken. You usually don't list your side dishes first, but, you know, I, it, this is fairly common knowledge, but, you know, it comes down to placement, like where you place things on the menu. The top right corner is one of the most often read areas of a menu for whatever reason. Um, not really sure why that is. I always jump down to the bottom of the menu. I don't know. You know, I don't know if it's just because of years of working in restaurants. I tend to, you know, I tend to go to the last first and just kind of work my way back. But um, generally, where you place certain items really dictates how well they sell. And we actually we actually played around with that a lot at Pokey Poblano. And, we had some dishes that we really believed in, but didn't necessarily sell too well. And then when we reprinted our menu, we didn't change a lot about the menu on the first pass, but we just kind of reformatted, restructured and, and moved things around into different categories and highlighted a few different dishes. And suddenly those dishes started to sell really well. And some of the dishes that we had success with on our last menu stopped selling at all Interesting. or very little. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so it really became uh, kind of obvious to us, like, okay, what, you know, how we, how we, you know, orient things and how we place things really does have an effect on people. Um, you know, we had a dish there that was a Japanese preparation as, as a hot stone. Basically it's like a, you know, a piece of granite that comes out on this tray and it's, you know, the stone's been over fire and it's, you know, 600 degrees and you cook your own, you basically cook your own protein at the table. It's kind of an interactive presentation. And when we had that dish front and center on our front page of the menu and we had it in its own section that kind of took up, you know, a bigger area than any of the other starters, we sold tons of them. <laughs> and then we reformatted our menu and thought, you know, we weren't, we didn't want to necessarily just push that. So we kind of lumped it back in with the other starters and the sales dropped at least 25%. <laughs> That's right. Really and we did nothing different other than just change, you know, where it was and how big, you know, the font was for that one specific dish. Um, right. It, yeah. It does. It does seem like there's a lot of, uh, a lot of factors there. Yeah, it comes down to everything, you know, font choice, um, dollar signs, dollar signs are a huge point of contention. Yeah, for a lot whether, of you, whether you, whether you use dollar signs or just like use, you know, like the number 14 or whatever. Absolutely. And yeah. that's, you know, and that's kind of funny because, you know, I think the dollar, removing the dollar signs is, is something that started out kind of in fine dining, but has trickled down all the way down to like fast casual restaurants. A lot of times don't right. have dollar signs anymore and it's just become kind of expected, but it does, it does confuse people sometimes. I, I mean, sometimes it makes yeah. the menu item look like it reads like whatever the name of the dish is. And then the number nine is part of, you know, I've had people order like the Italian nine sandwich, you know, or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And so the psychological effect of, of, of how you, how you lay it out, you know, a lot of people use pictures in a much more casual restaurant or family restaurant because people like, you know, let's just give like Chili's or Applebee's or any of those restaurants, for example, they put a lot of pictures on their menu because a lot of the, a lot of their guests like to just see what the food's going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. you know, but a lot of restaurants don't do that because they, you know, they think that it maybe cheapens their product or maybe puts them in that category and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to relate to that. Um, you know, I've noticed that a lot of, you know, smaller kind of mom and pop Asian restaurants will often have pictures just because maybe, you know, again, you don't know what the dish is going to look like, but if you see what it looks like and it looks good, you're more apt to order it. You know, mm -hmm. I think a lot of, um, a lot of smaller kind of, Asian restaurants love to put either 50 cents or 99 cents or 95 cents at the end of a total, like eight ninety five, eight ninety nine 99 instead of nine. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, old, old school marketing always told you, you know, eight ninety nine sounds cheaper than $9, <laughs> but you'll never see a restaurant who's trying not to appear cheap do that because, you right. know, it gives the S you know, gives the air of, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to give the perception of value when it's not there. Um, yeah. I think about that stuff when I was pricing my books because I knew it was, a, you know, the common strategy was to do like, you know, 1895 or whatever, right. but then it just seemed, it does seem kind of cheap to me. So I was, 
thinking about just switching it to, you know, I, I went back and forth between having it just be like 20 instead of 1995. Right. And yeah, it's still, like you said, there's a lot of factors there because it can be like, it seems kind of classier to just say what it is. As a, and, and most people see through they're like, oh, they, they want to make it look cheaper. So they're taking five cents off right. it or, or whatever, you know. Um, but I, I also read too, have you heard that it, a lot of people consider the 95 ending classier than the 99 ending? Yeah. Like 99 just seems ridiculous. Yes. You know, and and again, and I don't know how much this plays into it, but again, Asian restaurants, you'll see 99 a lot. And I don't know if that's kind of the MSG effect or not, but people <laughs> thinking that 99 looks worse than it is. I don't know. Right. Say, but, yeah. It's like they see, they see them doing it and they're like, well, that's, right. that's low class. I'm, yeah. I'm well, not doing that. Yeah, which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, the- but yeah, when you said the MSG effect, yeah, maybe we should mention that too because <laughs> both of us, we're both fans of MSG. And yes. if you look, if you research <laughs> MSG, if you read the Wikipedia, for example, on MSG, you'll find there's no evidence that it has any bad effects. It's a natural substance derived from, you know, natural ingredients. It's just a chemical process. There's, you know, M- MSG has a really bad rap. And I, I like to... Um, promote it whenever i get a chance yeah man msg for life <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. MSG, i'm gonna get a tattoo msg yeah. is one of those things and i know that uh it's been touched on a lot you know in social media and i know david chang did a piece that kind of de- you know debunked some of the some of the perception but yeah the the common perception is that it's a bad thing and you know i think a lot of it stems i a lot of the theories of why people perceive it as bad is because you know originally you know when a lot of when a lot of asian restaurants started opening up you know, early on when there weren't a lot of Asian restaurants in America, um, the, they would use monosodium, monosodium glutamate to, you know, to enhance the flavors of their food. And some of it, I think is a little bit like based on systemic racism. And I don't want to go to, uh, you know, especially in today's climate, the exotic wild, foods. Yeah, yeah. it was something that was distrusted amongst the public for whatever reason. And so a lot of restaurants started having it to advertise that they didn't use MSG. And so it reinforced the belief that it was bad because they, you know, as a business, they're like, well, all these people don't want to eat here because we use MSG. So we have to put a sign up that says we don't use it anymore, right. even if they did, right. Um, right. You know, which right. I'm sure there were, but it's, it, it reinforced that belief. And so, um, you know, there's been a lot of you know, fun kind of debunking of people in a room, all, you know, all quoted saying that they have an allergy to MSG or it makes them feel terrible. And they're passing out, you know, various snacks, for them to right. work on while they're in this focus group. Yeah. All these chips that are all that made MSG. In MSG. Yeah. So, and you know, at the end of the focus group, obviously nobody had a headache and everyone felt fine. And then the, you know, the curtain was, was pulled back that, Oh, you all ate MSG today. And so, yeah, anyway. So my personal theory, and I, this is probably somebody, something somebody else has written about, but my personal theory was obviously Chinese food is very salty. So I think a lot of people get headaches because of the salt afterwards. Sure, sure. And then they, they included in, you know, they associate it with this whole MSG uh, legend, you know? Right. And I think that's what happened. I agree. I think the sugar and salt content in Americanized, you know, Asian food often is much higher than what a lot of people are used to eating. So I think you're right. You know, a lot of times people just correlate, you know, right, not, part not of that. feeling as well, you know, it's just, it must be yeah. that one chemical, you know, cause everything else is normal. Right. And, you know, I've heard about that MSG. <laughs> that got MSG me. got me again. <laughs> So speaking of uh, the, the whole upselling thing, because I know that's a oh, yeah. that's a tactic people talk about a lot. Is that something that? What do you think of that? And is are there things you do to use that, or is there a chance that that kind of drives customers, you know, annoys them? What are your thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I think you know, in my position over the years, I think upselling kind of became a dirty word with a lot of servers. You know, upselling is a very corporate technique, and so it inherently brings a lot of that attitude of you know, it's it's kind of a corporate strategy and kind of seems you know, money grubbing or, you know, a little greedy at times. Um, you know, I think upselling is kind of morphing into this other concept. I think we, I think you sent me an article that touched on this as well as instead of upselling, you know, it's, it's finding ways to, you know, finding ways to, to, to give something, give a guest an option for something that they maybe didn't know they wanted, or maybe they didn't know that we had, or just, you know, finding ways to kind of round out the meal. You know, if somebody, if you have a table of four and everybody orders, you know, an entree, but they didn't order an appetizer. Well, you know, that's a perfect time to say, well, did you guys want to start with something to share? Um, you know, or anytime, you know, there's a lot of restaurants that have built in upsells, you know, there's a lot of places where you order an entree and it comes with, you know, a side dish, but the soup of the day is, you know, clam chowder. So do you want to add on a, you know, a cup of clam chowder, you know, for your side instead, it's an extra, you know, buck or buck 50. Mm. And, you know, so those built in upsells, um, you know, really, really kind of happen on their own. Um, ultimately, 
upselling is just part of the technique of trying to get the check average higher. You know, you're in a restaurant industry, your margins are disgustingly slim. You know, I, I broke it down basically like with a, with a, with a friend of mine the other day, it's like, you are going into a business where your margins are some of the worst in any business. You have between a five and 15% margin window, which is generally what people operate in. If you're doing above 15%, you're, you're in the vast minority of, of restaurants that are doing well. Um, so you have, you know, the worst margins in the world. You're investing your money in a, in a product that can spoil that you have to bring in and hope that it stays, you know, stays, you know, good in your refrigerator long enough to sell. Then you have to sell it to somebody and they have to like it for them to get a return on that initial investment for, you know, one of the worst margins ever. So yeah, it's, it's extremely tight, you know, so increasing check averages is really critical when it comes to, you know, getting better margins in the restaurant industry. You know, if somebody's spending, if you're, if your average clientele is spending $15 a person in your restaurant and you can suddenly get them all to spend $20 a person in your restaurant, that's a really large increase in sales over time. Yeah. Especially if it's, especially if it's drinks. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Especially on, on areas that have much better margins. Alcohol is known to have some of the best margins in the, you know, in the entire area. So mm-hmm. that's why bars and nightclubs often survive, <clears throat> you know, much longer with maybe less sales because, you know, their, their cost, of, their cost of goods is much lower on, on cheap alcohol. One thing I like to do at restaurants because I tend to not like making decisions. I'll ask the, uh, the server for their recommendation. Like what's your favorite food on the menu? Yeah. I love and, doing uh, that. Yeah. I think you get, I think you get some good results there, but then sometimes I notice like some servers will be like, oh, I don't, I don't, I haven't really eaten any of this. Is that, right. a, is that, a, is that a bad sign that they haven't <laughs> eaten the food or is that, it is that standard? It could be that they, it could be that you're in a place that sells meat and they're vegan or, you know, I, mm. I think it's a bad sign. Some other thing, yeah. So, you know, touching on that, you, you know, I agree. I like to ask servers what their favorite thing is too. And this goes back to the guest psychological aspect you know the uh, you know kind of reading how the server is you know you can use psychology as a guest to really kind of understand how adept your server server is at their job you know if, if you do ask their favorite they're like ah, i don't really know that's going to clue you in on a lot of things you know it's going to clue you in on their work ethics going to clue you in on how detail oriented they are it's going to clue you in on how you know how much they actually believe in the company they work for how much they're just going through the motions i mean it gives you a lot of clues so you know one of the things i think people forget is that you know, there's a lot of, I, and I say people, a lot of things servers forget is that there's a lot of psychological clues and reads that they give off throughout the meal that can be, Mm. you know, really triggering for guests. You know, if, like you said, if somebody doesn't really give you the impression that they know what's going on right off the bat, it sends up a red flag right away. You know, in your mind as the guest, you're sitting there going, well, now I don't know. I don't fully trust that my experience is going to be as good as, you know, someone who's sitting in that service section who looks like he's killing it with the crayon behind his ear. You know what I mean? So you, you often, you have to really watch yourself as a server because there's a lot of, there's a lot of clues that you can give off, you know, and as far as, you know, just how open you are to the table, are you making eye contact? Are you friendly? You know, are you responding with thoughtful answers? Are you giving the automatic company response? You know, are you trying to upsell things like a robot? Or are you actually suggesting something that you tried today that you thought wasn't, awesome combination. And so, you know, a lot of servers give off, I think a lot of bad psychological clues, a lot of bad tells basically when it comes to them doing their job. And there's a lot of people that approach being a guest as like, you know, they're doing a server a favor and it, and to a, to an extent they are doing them a favor by paying some of their, you know, some of their rent every month. But, you know, I've had people pull, like put a dollar amount on the table and tell the server, like, you know, I'm gonna leave your tip here, but you know, pick it up at the end. And then anytime something happens that they don't like, they take money out of it, which I think is a really messed up approach. If somebody, That's, uh, weird. I mean, yeah, if somebody does that to me right off the bat, like I, you know, I could care less. I actually had a had a server tell me one time that they had a table do that, and they were they were notorious for doing that. And it was her first, it was her first time taking them, and all the other servers warned them, like, oh, this guy, he always puts five one dollar bills and he always takes one away as soon as you don't bring something by. And so bizarre. he goes through his speech and he puts the $5 bills on thing. And he goes, now this is your tip. And as soon as he said, this is your tip, she snatches off the table and just puts it in her pocket and says, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'll be back. Have your dreams. <laughs> the guy never did it again. You know, the guy never did got, it again. So, got played. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty no, funny. But, um, snap, snap called him. I feel like uh, some servers try to hide the fact that they're new or not that knowledgeable. And that kind of 
backfires on them a bit too. It's like yeah. I can have I can have a real bad service experience, but as long as they're like honest or, or you know, and they 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 make a show of you know saying I, I screwed up or like I'm new and I'm learning. Like I'm I might even give them a, a bigger tip thing because I kind of feel bad for them. Yeah, now. definitely. And I actually, to be honest, I use that card a lot. Um, you know, there was. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, is that a trick? Well, yeah. No, it is a trick. And I would, I would actually, I, I started telling people that like I had been serving for months and I, there were times where maybe I kind of got a read that these people were going to be a little bit, you know, maybe not the most, maybe <laughs> yeah. a little hard on me, or maybe they weren't going to be, you know, as understanding. Maybe they just had kind of looked like they were maybe not the easiest people to deal with. And so I would start with that and just say, you know what, guys, this is my first week. I'm still learning. But then I would, I would absolutely nail every question they had because I've been doing it for months. And I would nail the entire thing. And so at the end of the meal, they're leaving going, oh, my God, you did such a great job. Like, I can't believe, you know, they would tell my manager, hold on to this one. You know, I know he's new. This guy's a star. And so, like, it was kind of hilarious and, you know, a little little deceitful. But, um, again, it's just psychology, you know. It's how do you maximize – how do you maximize your money, you know, when you're dealing with people? You know, how do you you find the way to – Yeah, I kind of – I remember doing that. I think I did that a few times when I was serving, too, at a sushi restaurant and uh, (laughs) – At an ice cream parlor yeah. thing, place I worked at too. Yeah, if I, it was more like if I screwed up. Yeah, and yeah. I was trying trying to save face. I'm like, yeah, I'm 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 pretty new here because right. news, uh, you know, new is subjective, Absolutely. obviously. So. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, six months <laughs> or a year even can be viewed as new. Yeah, their so. tenured employees are tenured employees. So uh, you know, you've got <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, you're new. You're just stretching you're new for the, the first stretching years. the truth. Yeah, honestly, a lot of a lot of restaurant work, unfortunately. Uh, involves stretching the truth, you know, it really does. And that and even with menus, you know, and even with, you know, it's not a very, it's not a very good practice, but I know there are tons of restaurants, you know, who put, you know, a certain type of product on their menu saying we only use this, but when that runs out, they're substituting something else. Oh, they're yeah. not telling you, you know, the best restaurants will tell you, you right. know, Hey, just so you know, we had to make this substitution. Is that okay? If it's not okay, you know, we can probably discount it a little bit for you or whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of that. Well, yeah, and it seems like there's been a lot of articles about that deception on the distributor and like olive oil and fish, you know, yeah. like there's so many, yeah, there's so much, apparently like so much olive oil, even imported olive oil and uh, that get, that is just, you know, regular vegetable oil or mostly vegetable oil of other sorts. And then there's so many fish, uh, different species of fish that like you literally are like more likely for some of these types of fish to have a fake, you know, version of that fish yeah. in a restaurant than the real one. So yeah, it's kind of rampant uh deception it seems like yeah it definitely can be how much does the atmosphere and the like the acoustics and the and the music and the, those kind of things do you do you have many opinions about that because i one thing that i was heard recently was that plays a big effect in comedy clubs like how tight and like kind of intimate the uh setting is because it amplifies the laughs definitely. a lot more in a comedy club yeah uh, and i was wondering if there was any sort of similar thing like that for restaurants oh, absolutely i mean the psychology of restaurants starts from the minute you look them up online. You know, we touched on the social media aspect of having a brand that, that people can see very clearly from, you know, the story you're trying to tell online. But I think the best restaurants kind of draw you into a space. They draw you into kind of a different kind of atmosphere than, than the norm. You know, if you can kind of get people to feel like they're walking into, you know, another city or another area that, you know, that they're not familiar with um, it's really effective. You know, there's a lot of subtle design choices that, you know, the best restaurants really employ to, to really make the the atmosphere feel, you know, kind of cozy at times, but, but still, you know, intriguing. And, you know, a lot of restaurants use a lot of techniques to kind of draw your eye to different areas of the restaurants so that you kind of, you know, feel like you're comfortable in your space, but you also kind of are curious about, you know, other areas of the restaurant. Um, <clears throat> you know, the restaurants that have the ability to do that are often the, the large corporate ones or the ones that, you know, the smaller ones that have a lot of money, you know, because that, that really takes a lot of work, you know, design and, and decor is a huge kind of part of the budget that you don't necessarily have to put into, you know, there's plenty of restaurants where you walk in, it's just a room full of tables, menu on the wall and a register. And yeah, they, you know, it suffices, it suffices the needs, but it already, if that walking into that environment preps you for what the expectation is, you know? So if you're, if you're trying to offer an experience for guests then you really have to start by offering them a setting to have that experience and then, service and the food and everything kind of have to follow suit. Um, but yeah, I mean, everything from, from lighting to acoustics, you know, at night you want the lighting to come down, but you still want tables to be lit, you know, in ways that people can still see their food, but maybe not feel like they're under a spotlight. Um, Mm -hmm. acoustics are very important. You know, we actually, we actually had some people consult us on the acoustics at Poblano because it was kind of an open room 
kind of feel in some parts. And I felt like it was kind of echoey in certain areas. And um, yeah, we had to kind of troubleshoot a little bit of sound dampening here and there, just because there were some areas where you had great sound for, you know, conducive conversation. And there were some tables where if I was sitting, you know, three feet from you across the table, the sound would just kind of get, you know, swallowed by the room. Um, so yeah, it was really interesting. We actually tried to do a comedy night or we only well, we tried to do a comedy. We did a few comedy nights at Poblano. Um, but what I say tried is the, the, really the biggest issue was the acoustics. And, you know, we had some people sitting in a different section that wasn't really part of where the comedy was going on, but those conversations were echoing like well into the area where the comp, you know, it kind of drowned out some of the comedy mm. stuff and it really made it feel like it wasn't an intimate area. And I think it made it really hard, <clears throat> you know, having live music is great. You know, again, that's a psychological effect of, Oh, there's something happening here. This place is cool. It, feels, it, feels fancy. Yeah, it makes yeah. people want to stay. It makes people want to hang out because there's something going on in the background, but you know, you're all kind of in the shared kind of experience. And again, though, if you have live music, but it's too loud or too echoey, then it's, it's a deterrent. You know, I had a lot of, I've had a lot of guests that were, you know, maybe had hearing issues or just didn't appreciate loud music that, you know, really didn't really didn't jive with that whole approach, you know? So really, you know, it kind of alienate us a little bit in some respect. Uh, yeah. Speaking of the, uh, the interior design of the restaurant. Yeah. We talked about this a bit, uh, before the podcast, but, uh, yeah, one of our favorite um, restaurants in Portland is this uh, ramen place, Japanese place, Maru, and they have a few uh, locations. Each location has a different name, but it's uh, and it's owned by this. We found out it's owned by this large Tokyo-based conglomerate that owns like a hundred restaurants or something. But they just uh, do the decor so well that it's kind of hard to say for me how much my enjoyment of the place stems from the decor and the and the vibe in there, and how much comes from the food. I mean, the food is obviously it is is objectively really good but it's also like i just get something from this cool vibe that they've established on, in in there and it's like obviously like you said it's something that it's a it's a corporate uh entity and they've obviously put a lot of work and science and philosophy into the layout of this thing and it's kind of like it gives this sense that you're in this outdoor area you know it has like almost like little cart things uh, uh structures you know above the the cooking area and the sushi making area so it gives you this sense that you're in this outdoor kind of uh food market kind of yeah, area, like, a, you know? like an alleyway and, uh, like a you know an alleyway in tokyo yeah <clears throat> kind of tight yeah tight spaces but not too tight and yeah it's just the uh the vibe and, and when you had pointed out some of those things i realized that i didn't really i had seen a little bit of it but i hadn't really gotten what was what was appealing about right. it and yeah there's just there's there's this inter interplay of like the the places that we like the most are there's probably a lot of unconscious things going on there about why we like them like maybe we grew up in uh, a house or had a grandparents that had similar furniture to you know something they're using in there yeah. or whatever it is that makes you feel comfortable and nostalgic or Absolutely. something or maybe it's a place you visited that you loved or whatever yeah definitely i mean decor is is really critical and like you said you know they did a great job with making it feel like you're transported into another space or another place you know you walk mm -hmm. in there and it did feel very reminiscent of like an alleyway in Tokyo that had a, a bunch of little, I believe it's a izakaya or something like that, you know, it's like a, a bar. It's like yeah. a Japanese pub, but they're, you know, these pubs are, you know, often just like a counter with five seats, you know what I mean? And then there's mm -hmm. another one next door. And then there's another one next door that serves, you know, one guy serving ramen, the next guy's doing sushi, you know, whatever. And so that's kind of that whole, you know, really tight downtown Tokyo grimy kind of, you know, grassroots, like this mm -hmm. is where you go to find the best ramen. Yeah, they did a great job of uh, recreating that, uh, that kind of environment. Um, you know, and I've often said that I feel like some of the, some of the coolest restaurants I've been in and some of the ones that are the most fun, uh, almost always tie in elements of outdoors inside, you know, whether it's bringing mm -hmm. trees inside or making the ceiling look like it's a night sky or adding, you know, balcony kind of looking things, you know, like you'd see in New Orleans where there's like a, you know, second story balcony with windows, like even if they're just false windows, you know, those kind of elements, when you bring those inside, it really transports people and it really kind of changes their whole perception of, of what's going on. I mean, you know, that restaurant did an amazing job with just creating that homegrown feel, you know, from every detail down to the, you know, the seats and the, you know, the woodworking and even the menu and the font choices they used and, you know, the way they did it, it, it made it feel very, very, you know, independent mm -hmm. owner. <laughs> and that's a brilliant choice on their respect, because I would think that, especially in Portland, the market would much rather support, you know, local or, or home, you know, homegrown independent owners 
than these huge corporate, you know, chains. Like I don't remember seeing a lot of like TGI Fridays and various things like that in yeah, Portland. You know much. what I mean? I don't think they get a lot of people supporting that because Portland's a very kind of different market. You know, they're, they're very community based and neighborhood based. And so for a Japanese company, you know, with hundreds of locations and billions of dollars to kind of recognize that and come into Portland and, and open that and, and really kind of offer that, you know, that kind of perception is really just telling like, you know, how much goes into the whole thing and, and really how smart, right. you know, the business really can be if, if you have enough people working on it with you. Yeah. It kind of makes me wonder, like if you pulled people coming out of that, like how many people would actually guess that that was not some huge, you know, conglomerate, how yeah. many people would be oh, thinking first, like them, it's a smaller <clears throat> group of restaurants. No, I, at first glance, I think, I think most of us, you know, would, would think that it was a small place. You know, I, I definitely, I definitely thought that, you know, it was a, a Portland based company. Mm-hmm. You know, I obviously, some of the detail work and some of the aesthetic and what they were doing, I said, okay, well, they're obviously doing well. They have a lot of money. You know what I mean? So they've, mm-hmm. they've figured out a, something that works, but it made a lot more sense when we started to understand that, you know, these were multi-million dollars worth of it decision does. makings. Yeah. Going into it. And you know, some of the, some of the clue there too was their service staff. You know, if you looked at how their service staff was operating, they were, they were upbeat. They were very thorough. They were, you know, very, you know, friendly. They used a lot of eye contact. There was a, kind of a corporate kind of kind of feel to the service staff and manager, you know, the manager was very pleasant and, you know, they looked, you know, the staff kind of looked more of like a corporate staff than anything. Nothing else in that restaurant really Mm. stuck out to me as this might be a a chain, but the staff, you know, and, and that's Mm. honestly, you know, that didn't bother me. I think that they did. I think they did a great job with it. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. If anybody's comes to Portland and wants to eat there, it's called Maru. It's got a longer name, Yadamara or Maru or something like that. Oh but man, that ramen cheap. though is delicious. Yeah. It's good Dang. stuff. Yeah. Um, super tasty. And they got a full vegan menu, uh, not full, but they have a smaller, uh, separate vegan menu too. And they they have four locations in just in Portland. So, uh, recommend that. I had a few questions that people sent me that weren't directly uh, tied to like psychology. So I think I'll send you those and maybe I'll, I'll put them on the blog. If you answer a few. Sure. And if people are, are curious about that, the blogs at reading video slash blog. And again, Robin does some, uh, he's available for some consulting uh, for, you know, restaurant uh, operations or, or strategy or opening things like that. He's in uh, Albuquerque these days. You can find him. Let me see what I, I have your Twitter here. One second. He's new to Twitter, but his Twitter <laughs> is Dibble Robin. That's D I B B L E Robin R O B I N, and he's on Instagram with a very hard to re, uh, communicate uh, <laughs> title. It's Doctor Period Underscore Period Dibs. So Doctor Dibs. I think that's, if you I think if you search Doctor Dibs, I it should okay. be one of it should be what pops up first. Um, oh, so okay. Yeah, so Doctor There might be one space or two. Of, dip. Yeah, if you just search Doctor yeah. Space Dibs. You definitely uh, didn't make yeah. that easy on anyone. No, else. no. Yeah, I was trying to go for the, the hardest, to, <laughs> yeah, hardest yeah. To, to dictate. Yeah, it's yeah, it's contrary and it's cool. Good business decision, you know, very calculated. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's mystery. You know, it's like taking your restaurant hard to get to or something, you know. <laughs> right. Um, Speakeasy Instagram approach. Yeah. All right. Cool. This has been a great talk. Thanks for coming on, Robin. Yeah, man. It was an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for listening. That was a talk with restaurant manager Robin Dibble. This has been the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. You can learn more about it at peoplewhoreadpeople.com. Thanks for listening.